1965, at the corner of East New York Street and North Denny Street, sat a dilapidated craftsman home. It was split into two and rented as a duplex. The Baines whiskeys, they occupied one. The matriarch was scraping to make ends meet, her seven children ranging from 17 to 1. Looking at Gertrude Baines Whiskey Rye, you would see a woman who was run down, possibly ill. However, in her eyes, you could see she was at the brink of being defeated in life. Odd jobs were not cutting it. Her newest lover was 15 years her junior, and he had ran out on her, not ready to face the woes of parenthood. Today, the lot located at East New York Street and North Denny Street sits vacant, purchased to be the parking lot for a local church. But the horrors of what happened there were demolished on April 23, 2009. The memory of what happened in that home will forever remain. Welcome to the True Crime Librarian. I'm your librarian and host, Ashley. Tonight, I'm going to introduce to you a case that ripped through the headlines in October of 1965. So many youths were prosecuted in this case, and they were led and encouraged by a woman who took out the stressors of life on an innocent 16-year-old girl, who she had agreed to look after as if she was her own. Lester and Betty Likens never thought that one of their girls would die at the hands of the woman who had agreed to take them in. They trusted her, and she took from them one of their babies. This case is interesting to say the least, so stick with me as we dive into the murder of Sylvia Likens. Warning. This episode contains graphic detail of torture, murder, adult situations, and adult language. Listeners' discretion is advised. If you feel any of this may be too much for you, please skip this episode or have someone listen with you or for you. Good evening, all of my true crime nerds. I want to do a little bit of housekeeping tonight before we get started into this new case of the new season. First, let me say how much I have missed you all. This last three weeks has been the longest three weeks I think I've ever had in 2020 just kicked my butt those last three weeks and I ran into some things I was nowhere prepared to handle. So, that's why I had to take a break. However, last week on social media, on Facebook and Instagram, we did a little bit of a get to know your host. So if you're not following me on Instagram or Facebook, go do so now at the True Crime Librarian so you never miss an upload and you always get to figure out or at least hear what's going on with the librarian. Don't forget to subscribe on your favorite podcast platform or even on YouTube so that you never miss a case. Let's not forget to slide over to the merch store and pick something up. This not only lets you support the show, but will give you something in return. Okay, enough of that. Let's get to what you all came here for, the true crime. Let me introduce you to our victim, Sylvia Marie Likings. She was born on January 3rd, 1949. It is January 3rd of 2021. She would be 72 years old had she never met the Baines Whiskey family. July 3rd, 1965 would be known as the butterfly effect for Sylvia and her sister Jenny. Betty Likens, their mother, she was arrested that morning around 1030 for shoplifting. It was a hot Saturday in Indiana and Betty was on her way with the girls to go to Rollerland. And she was dressed in black slacks, and she decided that was going to be too hot for their activity. So let's stop in over at this discount house. It's similar to a thrift store. And she picked up a pair of shorts or pedal pushers. Jenny really couldn't remember when she later talked about this event. She couldn't remember if her mom picked up shorts or pedal pushers, which if you don't know what a pedal pusher is, it's just a capri, only a little higher up on the leg. And so Jenny went into the dressing room with her mother, Betty, and inside there, instead of Betty disrobing and trying on these shorts or 
whatever. She stuffs them in her purse. And Jenny, she did not like to be around her mother when she did things like this. So when she left the dressing room, she grabbed Sylvia's arm and they walked out of the store. And as Betty was leaving the store, a clerk grabbed her by the arm and asked her to step back inside and empty the contents of her purse. Well, guess what fell out? Yep, the shorts or pedal pushers or whatever. So she was arrested and she was taken off to jail in the paddy wagon. And I had to say that word because it's paddy wagon. Why not? But before she could go, she did give the girls $2 to go get something to eat because she had no idea how long she was going to be in jail. And their father, Lester, he was in the Northwest Indiana area in Lebanon. And the reason he was there was at the time Lester and Betty had separated. and. This wasn't the first time Betty and Lester separated. This wasn't the first time the girls went through something like this. Unfortunately, they had become numb to this kind of effect going on in their life. So when mom was hauled off to jail, they took their $2 and they went and spent some of it immediately on ice cream. Now, back in the day, 1965, I think they spent like 82 cents on ice cream for the both of them. So they still, you know, had a dollar eighteen give or take to eat dinner on. But past that, they had no idea. None. What they were gonna do. And there's no telling when their mother was going to be released. So the girls make their way back over to the apartment that they were living in with their mother and they started to hang out with their friend Darlene. And they were just kind of walking through the streets of Indianapolis. And the girls were still pretty new to the area. Their family had grown up north of Indianapolis, but they had been in California for a little bit because their parents, they just didn't hold down jobs very well. And so they had just gotten back, hadn't really made any new friends. School hasn't started. So they were just walking aimlessly around with their friend Darlene. And Darlene decided, hey, let's go hang out over at this house. I know the kids. They've got a couple girls our age. We'll go hang out with them. They're really cool. Come on, you know, let's just go over there. Well, Jenny and Sylvia, were, they didn't have anything to do. I mean, their mom was in jail. What were they going to do? So they went over to 3850 East New York Street at the corner of North Denny Street. And they went and Darlene introduced them to Paula Baines Whiskey and Stephanie Baines Whiskey. And it was very apparent that there was a lot of kids in this house coming in and out. And to determine whose kid was who was highly unlikely as Darlene only knew Paula, really. I mean, she kind of knew Stephanie, but not enough. So figuring out what kids belonged and what kids didn't, not an easy task, but neither Sylvia or Jenny really even cared. They had new friends. So they hung out over there at the Baines Whiskey House and around dinner time, Gertrude invited Jenny to dinner. And Jenny said that she would accept the offer only if it meant that Sylvia could stay too. And Gertrude was like, oh yeah, yeah, she can stay. She immediately disregarded Sylvia. It, it didn't take long for there to already be some animosity between Gertrude and Sylvia. Sylvia is 16. She doesn't understand what's going on through Gertrude's mind. However, Gertrude is 37 years old. And for her to have that kind of animosity already with a teenage girl, a little suspicious. Not much, but just a little. Because you want to be like, why? Why? Would you, I mean, you had a life at 16. She has a life at 16. There's difference there. You know what I'm saying? So what was the point of being jealous? What, I mean, what was it? I don't know. Honestly, the more we look into this case, the more we're not going to know what's going on through Gertrude's head. But for whatever reason, she invited Jenny and Jenny only accepted the offer to stay for dinner if Sylvia could stay as well. After dinner, the girls returned back to their mother's apartment where they sat alone and just were kind of, they just, they sat around not really knowing what to do. I mean, it was just them. You know, their dad was in Lebanon. They had an older brother and sister. 
They did not live at home. Both of them were around the ages of 18, 19 years old. It was a set of twins. And then Jenny was also a part of a set of twins, but her brother was living with their grandparents at the time. And it was just Jenny and Sylvia with Betty. Sylvia didn't understand what had happened that day, and neither did Jenny. She didn't understand that by them two going with Darlene over to the Baines Whiskey's house, they entered into what would be a fatal connection between them. On July 4th of 1965, Jenny decided she was going to hang around the apartment hoping that her mother would come home, and Sylvia decided she was going to go hang out with her friend Darlene again. When she finally did return to her mother's apartment later that afternoon, Paula Baines Whiskey was with them. And Jenny remembers overhearing Paula say that she was too much pregnant at the age of 17. Now, this isn't unheard of. 1965, being married at the age of 17 was not uncommon, but it wasn't as common as it was in 1929. You know what I'm saying? So for her to be pregnant, not really uncommon. However, the the part that just makes this all weird is she's 17, she's pregnant, and the father is a married man. She had ran off with the father a few months prior outside of Indiana. They had their little tiff in the sack and they came home and the guy decided he was going to stay with his wife and Paula was out on her ass with his baby. And nobody even knew. That night, Sylvia, Jenny, Darlene, and Paula went back to the Baines Whiskey home. They all had Cokes in their hand. They were chatting it up, laughing. It was a good night. That night, Sylvia and Jenny were invited to stay the night with Gertrude and her children. And when Gertrude went to bed, the kids stayed up. They were going to ring in the birthday of Shirley. She was turning 12 and they waited until midnight so they could all celebrate the very first moments of Shirley's birthday. However, around midnight, two men knocked at the door and with Gertrude already in bed, the sound of two grown men's voice woke her from her sleep and she went to go investigate and see what's going on in the living room. When she walked in, she was there. She was greeted by Lester Likens and Danny Likens. Danny is one of the older brothers from the set of twins of Sylvia and Jenny. And it's at this moment that Gertrude kind of turns on her charm. The thing with Gertrude is she loved the attention of men. And she hoped that one of those men, whoever she latched onto, were going to give her this life of luxury where the demand on her was non-existent. Honestly, she loved the thought of being a stay-at-home mom, but she didn't want to do the housework. She didn't want to raise the kids. She just kind of wanted to sit around and be lazy, really. I mean, if we're going to cut down to it, that's all she really wanted to do. We'll get more into Gertrude in just a second. With Lester in the home, Gertrude invited him and his son Danny to stay and join the girls in sleeping over. Lester had been looking for his girls all day. He had heard that his wife had been arrested for, for shoplifting and he needed to figure out where the girls were. He had an opportunity that was presented to him and he needed to talk to Betty to make sure that it would work for everybody involved. And that night, Lester kind of broke down when she, he was sitting there talking with Gertrude. And she listened to him, not necessarily cry, but she listened to him talk about his woes in the marriage with Betty and the problems that they had, but the way that he loved her, things like that. And after hearing the way Lester felt about his wife and the opportunity that was presented and the situation, after Gertrude heard about all of that, she extended what would become a devastating offer to the Likens family. She said that she would board Sylvia and Jenny while Lester and Betty traveled with the carnival. And in return, she would just charge him $20 a week. 
her theory was, I've got seven kids. What's two more? No big deal. We can do this. They're practically grown, right? Lester really couldn't believe what Gertrude had offered, but he knew he needed to talk to Betty first before he accepted this offer. So that night ended with him thanking her for her offer and letting her know, I need to talk to my wife first. Now, generally in the Baines Whiskey home, Shirley, Marie, and Jimmy, all younger siblings of Paula and Stephanie, they shared a room and they would switch every night. One night, Shirley would sleep in the bed and Marie and Jimmy would be on the floor. The next night, it would be Marie and Shirley and Jimmy would be on the floor. But the night that Jenny and Sylvia stayed, they got to sleep in the bed while the other three children slept on the floor. The girls felt welcomed by the children. Gertrude, not so friendly with Sylvia, but... The rest of the kids seemed to like her thus far. Had Lester taken half a second when the offer was extended to him for his girls to live there and just look around the home, he would have known this wasn't the best place for them to be staying, okay? When whoever split this craftsman home into two, making it a duplex, what failed to happen in the unit that the Baines Whiskies lived in was there was no stove. There was a hot plate, and that's it. And Gertrude didn't hold down a job. She did ironing. She would lend out for laundry and things like that. She would watch some of the neighborhood kids. But Paula, she had a job. And if Gertrude needed more money, Paula picked up more hours. That's just how it went. On July 6th of 1965, Lester found Betty. She was at her parents' house. She had just been released from jail. And they talked about his plans to travel with the carnival. And it was going to work out great because this lady named Gertrude Wright, who she was going by Wright at the time, had offered to take in Jenny and Sylvia. And all it was going to cost them was 20 bucks a week, which... They were going to make way more than that traveling with the carnival, so it was a win-win kind of situation. Neither Lester nor Betty felt like their parents were capable of taking care of Sylvia, Jenny, and her twin brother, Benny. They just kind of thought Benny was a handful enough, and, and Jenny and Sylvia would just add to the stress, and they didn't want to do that. So that's why boarding with the Baines Whiskies sounded like a great idea, but I don't, I don't know. It was a different time in 1965. I wouldn't, I wasn't around. I don't know how this played, how common it was for somebody to take somebody else in like that. I mean, nowadays we'd be very skeptical about anybody who extended an offer like that, or we'd be skeptical of anybody who asked us to board their kids. You know what I'm saying? It's not a common thing, but in 1965, it could have been. I have no idea. Lester did leave one piece of advice, and, you know, I think this should have been taken uh, less serious than what Gertrude took it, because it, it's like every parent. We all like to pick and and nag on the way our children behave, but Nine times out of ten, they go into someone else's house and they have manners that you didn't know that they were capable of having. So Lester had said, you'll take care of these girls with a firm hand because their mother let them do as they please. And they weren't bad children at, by any means. Neither Sylvia nor Jenny were. So for him to be quoted into saying that, I would say he thought this was a joke. She'll take it as a joke, you know, that kind of thing. But Gertrude, she took it as serious as one could take it. And especially when it came to Sylvia. Let me introduce you to Gertrude White Beans Whiskey. She's a little different, but I'm, you know, at this point, let me give you her history. Maybe it'll clarify something for you. Not really so much for me. Gertrude was born September 19th in 1928. 
Her father died of a heart attack at the age of 11 and she was right there with him when it happened. This could have played some sort of role in the way she would act as an adult. Maybe the neat, the constant neediness of men's attention came from this. I don't, I don't know. Maybe, possibly. In the end, nothing excuses the jealousy she's going to exhibit over Sylvia. At the age of 16, she quit school and she married her first and what would become her third husband, John Bingswitzky. He was two years her senior, so she was 16 and he was 18. During their marriage, she clerked in a drugstore and dime stores to supplement the income, all while she birthed four children to John and suffered a few miscarriages through that time as well. Ten years into their marriage, Gertrude decided, I'm not happy here. So she did something a little sordid and taboo. She divorced John. Life could potentially be better if she married someone else, someone who had money or ambition. However, John was a policeman and he just wasn't raking in enough money to make her happy. She was still having to supplement the income. So she ran off and married this guy named Edward Guthrie, and the marriage was super short-lived. It was three months, and it said that these two fought like cats and dogs the entire three months. Edward did not like the four Baines Whiskey children. Surprise, surprise, because Gertrude's not really raising them. She doesn't want to raise them. They were just product of having sex, and... Oops, we got pregnant. In 1965, abortions, not really common. They're not something you can look up in the phone book and be like, oh, I can go. No. So she birthed children. It seemed like her thing. Once she divorced Edward, she went back to Indiana where she moved in with John and eventually they remarried for a second time. During this shorter than before marriage, Gertrude birthed two more children to John and suffered a miscarriage or two I think she suffered two miscarriages during this short stint being married to John in the end the two just weren't compatible they divorced again for a second time and Gertie well she had herself a new beau and he was so much younger Gertrude took the kids and she moved out so that she could carry on the love affair with Dennis Lee Wright Together, they had a son, Dennis Lee Wright Jr. Dennis was not one who wanted a family, at least not yet. So as soon as Gertie had their son, he ran out. He would come in and out of the home, mostly for sex and money, and Gertie, she would let him have his way. And if she didn't, he would beat her, plain and simple. In mid-May, Gertie suffered a miscarriage with the couple's second child, and it's at this point it seems things really went down with her health, both physically and mentally. She had surf Gertrude suffers from several lung ailments. Um, she had asthma, she had chronic bronchitis, but she smoked like a freight train, and that habit only exasperated her difficulty with breathing. And this would make her on edge, make her lash out even over some of the most minor infractions. Let me introduce you to Sylvia Marie Likens further, a little bit on her history. Like I had said before, she was born on January 3rd, 1949. She was one of five and she came between two sets of twins, Danny and Diana, who were two years older, and Benny and Jenny, who were a year younger than she was. And she has been quoted for saying she felt she was the odd one in the family because she was born between two sets of twins. Sylvia was a cute girl. She had long, blonde, curly hair. And it just sat below her shoulder, so it was long for that. But the most thing that was noticeable about Sylvia was her smile. She never smiled big with her teeth showing, and that's because one of her front teeth were missing. She had gotten into an accident with one of her brothers when she was younger, and she knocked it out. And this was something she was extremely self-conscious about. Some say she had a sassy look to her. 
she was no angel, but she was religious. She had been baptized just two years before at the East 6th Street Christian Church in Indianapolis. She was generally very quiet, unassuming, and everyone liked her. She was helpful. She gladly lended a helping hand around the house. She would hand her mother money from her regular babysitting jobs and some of the ironing that she would take in. She was neither smart nor stupid. She made average grades, uh, but on her 16th birthday, she had dropped out of school. Just like her father, her mother, her sister, and her brother had done. But now that she was living with the Baines Whiskies, she had planned to enter Arsenal Technical High School as a freshman. This was her mother's alma mater. The first week at Gertrude's house at 3850 East New York Street was pleasant. She listened to phonographic records with the other children. Sylvia and Jenny would walk to one of the three parks that were then about a three-mile walking distance from the home. Jenny, however, did suffer polio as a young child, which left her with a minor handicap in her leg. It, was, it had just developed weaker than the other. And she needed a brace to help her walk, but it didn't stop her. She walked with Sylvia to one of those three parks on more than one occasion. Gertrude was struggling to pay a $55 a month rent and keep food in the house. And this is where Paula and her job kind of comes into play. And at the time, I can't find that Sylvia was babysitting or was she lending out ironing. It seems like Paula had a weight job and Gertrude was just babysitting the neighborhood children and lending out ironing. So they weren't making a whole lot of money. However, the Baines Whiskey's house, rich or poor, was the focal point of the neighborhood children's hangout. So we had Darlene, who Sylvia and Jenny were friends with. She comes in and out of the house. We have Richard Hobbs at he was 14. He lived two doors down. He was in and out of the home. Judy Duke, Ann Sisko, Mike Monroe, Randy Lepper, and others in and out of the home all day long. And Gertrude, sometimes she would snap and sometimes it was welcome. And she's a weird duck, okay? She has this thing for younger boys. And the younger it seems like, the better. I don't know. Maybe it's because she is experienced and these teenage boys, is, they're not. And Gertie is willing to teach them. Maybe that's what it is. Meals were skimpy around the home. Most of the times it would be two pieces of toast. Sometimes that toast would be with butter. There would be no lunch as the kids are instructed to kind of stay out all day long. And then dinner would consist of either soup and crackers, since they only had the hot plate to warm food on, or a sandwich, depending on the situation with the groceries. Sylvia and Jenny would get a small taste of what's to come in the next few weeks to months when Lester's first money order for the weekly $20 did not come in on the day that Gertrude was expecting it. So she sends the Baines Whiskey children upstairs and Jenny and Sylvia, they're instructed to go with Gertrude to her room where she slaps the both of them and says through gritted teeth, quote, well, I took care of you two bitches for a week for nothing, end quote. The next day, $20 money order was in the mail, but there was not an apology to either girl for the behavior that had just happened the day before. Lester and Betty showed up to visit their daughters just two days after this incident, and neither Sylvia or Jenny said anything. They didn't complain. They didn't do anything. Nothing. They didn't, they didn't tell their parents, well, mom, we're only getting a piece of toast with butter for breakfast, no lunch and soup for dinner. That's not enough for children who are growing. It wasn't their place to say anything, and Betty is quoted later on saying it wasn't her place to question Gertrude and her home. But if your children are staying there, it is your place. Just before they left, they handed Gertrude another $20 in advance for the next week. And again, not one 
word of an apology was uttered to Sylvia or Jenny for the way that she had just acted. So she made 40 bucks within three days after she slapped them across the face, pissed off because his money didn't come in in time. On July 17th of 1965, Sylvia rode with the kids and Gertrude to go pick up Stephanie. Now, Stephanie, she would become one of Sylvia's closest friends in the home. And Stephanie didn't realize that Sylvia and Jenny were residents in the home as shortly after she had met them, she had gone to stay with her father. On the third week of July, Sylvia and Jenny received the paddle once again from Gertrude. As she suspected, Sylvia of making the Baines Whiskey's children loiter at the grocery stores and pick up Coke bottles to turn in for pocket change. Now, Lester had taught his girls a little bit of street smarts, and one of those things was if you pick up glass bottles, you can recycle them for a nickel a bottle. That's, an, that's little to nothing change, even at that time. Just something to put in the kids' pockets. However, that's not what had occurred. Yet, Gertrude paddled them with what is considered a sorority-style paddle or fraternity-style paddle. And it's about a quarter inch thick. And most days, Sylvia would consider herself lucky if that paddle hit her in her back instead of her butt. She was paddled so wildly once that she was hit upside the head with that thick piece of wood. That just goes to show you the rage that Gertrude was capable of flying into over little to nothing. In August of 1965, it wasn't the worst, but it did have a couple notable incidents. And both of these incidents called into question Sylvia's honesty and her chastity. Sylvia had accidentally or inadvertently think she I didn't think she'd ever think anything would come about it, but she did reveal that she had been accused of stealing when they lived in California and that she and her boyfriend in California had gone underneath the covers. However, nothing happened other than kissing, maybe some touching. But as far as whether or not Sylvia was a virgin, she was still a virgin. Sylvia was not going to let these two moments in August steal, steal the good moments that she was experiencing. She, had, she was attending Sunday school on a regular with the other Baines Whiskey's children. The trips to the park were where she was free to be sociable and enjoy time without being, without worrying that what she was saying or her actions could be misconstrued and turned around against her. Reverend Roy Julian was pleased to see Sylvia in regular attendance, particularly on Sunday, August 22nd, when Sylvia and Jenny both came forward in front of the congregation and publicly confessed their faith. It is said that in one of the Sunday services that Paula was bragging about the 1st of August, and the incident that occurred that day, she slugged Sylvia so hard she broke her own wrist. But that's okay because the cast provided Paula with another weapon. She even told one of the church matrons that, quote, I tried to kill her. Who the brags about this? But even worse, why was there not one member in that church that heard what Paula was saying do anything about what was being said. Now, Paula is described as being a childish and immature 17-year-old girl. She wasn't stupid, but would explain that anything that would happen in her life were quote-unquote acts of God. Her being pregnant at 17, acts of God. Her breaking her wrist because she slugged somebody so hard in the face, acts of God. No, honey, those are called consequences. People say that because she ha she became like the second in command in the Baines Whiskey's home, it and and people say that because she became second in command at a young age, to her em emotionally unstable mother was not good quote unquote on the job training for becoming adult. 
Paula wasn't a big person, but she wasn't a small person either. She was a tiny frame, kind of like her mom. She stood only five foot four inches. However, she did weigh 160 pounds. So just slightly overweight for her height, but still a cute girl. But she had a mean streak in her a mile long. Paula once used the cast to hit Sylvia in the mouth and she split open her lips, which caused her to cry out in pain. Paula did this as Gertrude said that Sylvia had called her a disrespectful name. However, Paula didn't hear what name she was called. She was just taking her mother's word for it. And she's, she told Sylvia, quote, if you say anything else, I'm going to break this cast on you, end quote. Paula blindly at this point was following her mother. Another time, Gertrude claimed she was missing $10 from her purse, and she immediately pointed the finger at Sylvia, although no one ever saw Sylvia take the money, and nobody ever saw Sylvia use the money. And seeing as how the, the food situation inside the home wasn't good, you would think that a child with $10 would be feeding herself profusely, and you would be able to tell. But she wasn't. Nobody ever saw her with the money. No, Nobody ever saw her spend the money. But in the end, she was still punished for it. In the third week of August, there was very little in the way of food as Gertrude was just shy a few days of her next child support payment. This meant that each child received one piece of toast with a little bit of butter. And then at dinner, it was just a bowl of soup. But they had to eat in turns because at this point, there was only three spoons in the home. So there was eight people with Gertrude and her seven children. There's now 10 people in the home with Sylvia and Jenny. You have to eat in shifts of three. Somebody's left out. At this point, if one child got something to eat that the other one didn't, there would be argument and turmoil. It just wasn't good because you've got a whole bunch of hungry kids just foaming at the mouth for something warm and filling. Thankfully, there was one evening where the children got to receive a rare treat. They were able to attend one of the church suppers, and this meant they were going to get a warm meal that filled their bellies. However, Sylvia and Jenny ended up in trouble once again because Paula said they ate too much. This meant this time the punishment was Sylvia and Jenny were stripped before they were paddled. Sylvia received another punishment when Paula swore that she had eaten a White Castle hamburger. Paula said that she could smell the hamburger on her breath and there was even some mustard on her mouth. When in actuality, she didn't get anything. But still, she was punished by Gertrude who punched her in the eye, repeatedly trying to get her to confess that she had a hamburger. When that didn't work, Paula grabbed her by her hair and yanked her from the kitchen chair. It didn't matter whether or not she actually had the hamburger. For whatever reason, at this point in time, Paula decided Sylvia needed to be punished, and she knew that her mother would believe her no matter what she said. Jenny, she didn't escape any of the punishments. However, it is believed that due to her slight handicap with her polio, that Gertrude was not as hard on Jenny and almost empathetic of her in her situation. However, Jenny was still punished. But most of the time, Sylvia, she just bore the brunt of it all. Jenny had found an abandoned shoe in one of the parks close to the home. And due to the underdevelopment of one of her legs, it meant that she didn't have to have the same shoe for each foot. So she wore home this abandoned shoe and she wore it proudly. However, when she walked in the house, Gertrude accused her of stealing the shoe. Who steals just one shoe? I mean, I get it. She doesn't need one. But steal? No. For this, Jenny received licks for taking the shoe. And then Sylvia was handed 10 licks too for being in the park that day and failing to confirm Gertrude on her suspicions of Jenny stealing the shoe. Things just get worse, and you don't know why. I mean, you could say, hmm, she's stressed. Well, yeah, okay, I get that. She's got seven kids. She's got a young lover who wants nothing to do with her unless she wants to have sex with him or give him money. Um, 
She doesn't have any money coming in the house. You know, her ex-husband, he does pay, but not a lot. She's not getting any of the ironing that she used to get because there's neighborhood kids running in and out of her house all the time. So she's losing work. And now people are starting to talk around town that her daughter's pregnant by a married man. Life is kicking her in the teeth. So how does she handle that? Well, she turns around and she beats up on Sylvia. Now, here's my two cents, whether they matter or not. I think there's more jealousy when it comes to Sylvia more than anything. And I was corrected tonight um, and said that this should be called envy, and it could be envy. But I don't think that's what this is. I think it's jealousy because Gertrude craves the attention of boys and men. She don't care long as they're part of the opposite sex. And with teenage boys running in and out of her house, she feels like that if she decides to bat her eyes, they need to fall at her feet. Well, Sylvia is a young 16-year-old girl, blonde, curly hair. She's pretty. She's a nice person. She's a little sociable, but, you know, she's the new girl. Uh, never fails. Think about when you're in high school. If you had a new student start, they were kind of mysterious. Everybody kind of talked about them. And, and, you know, either all the girls or all the boys liked them, whatever. That's how this was. Sylvia was new. And Gertrude, she's 37. She's old news, right? Yeah, that pissed her off. And I, and I don't care what you want to call it. Envy, jealousy, whatever. She disliked Sylvia because she was receiving less attention from all the men and boys in the neighborhood. Plain and simple. Now, during the month of August, Lester and Betty visited the girls a few times, but never did they complain of the conditions or the treatment that was going on at the Baines Whiskey's home. However, they did ask for each visit for a burger and a Coke, and they got it every time. On August 27th of 1965, Gertrude and her attitude and mood soured because she wasn't working much due to it being the allergy season for those who have lung ailments. And really, honestly, she just didn't feel like working. Her child support payments were either not enough or not coming in on a regular basis, so they were scraping together. Well, in 1965, it was a criminal offense to not pay your newspaper boy. Well, guess what Gertrude was not doing? Not paying the newspaper boy. Now, later in the trial, Lester testifies that his payments were coming in on time. He had receipts for the money orders showing he had paid Gertrude $220. And he also testified that he paid another $80 in cash payments like he did just the day before she was arrested for not paying the newspaper boy. So, before that, Gertrude had zero marks on her criminal history. This was her first mark against her in life. At 37, she was arrested for not paying her newspaper boy. It wouldn't take more than a month before her criminal history would jump from not paying the newspaper boy to something far, far more sinister. Let's go back to Gertrude and her fascination with young boys for just a second, because I know we touched on this earlier, and I'm the the psychological evaluation of Gertrude. It's just it's mind boggling. Usually, I'm pretty quick to pinpoint some sort of behavioral issue. And I can look it up and I can, you know, do a checklist. Yep, they exhibit this. They exhibit this. But it seems like with Gertrude, her biggest flaw in life was her desire for younger men. And she had Paula, who was 17, Stephanie, who's 15, now Sylvia, who's 16. She has teenage boys running in and out of her house all day long. Which, for her, dream come true, because remember, Dennis Wright, he was 15 years her junior. She was 37, he was 22. When they had their first son, he wasn't even old enough to vote yet. So, 
anyways, back to her, her like for these younger men. She's got Richard Hobbs, who lives a couple doors down. He's a teenage boy. She's got Randy Leeper from the neighborhood. She's got Mike Monroe, Coy Hubbard, who is Stephanie's boyfriend. He doesn't live directly in the neighborhood, but the Baines Whiskey's grandmother lived in his neighborhood. So when the children would go over there and visit, that's how he came to know Stephanie and they started dating. And these boys parading in and out of her home, this is just her ultimate fantasy. It was said that at one point, Gertrude had began dancing provocatively for a 14-year-old boy in the living room. Now, a full-grown man may not have found her dancing as erotic as a 14-year-old would. Um, she could have been doing the chicken dance half-dressed, and a 14-year-old boy would be like, mm, I like that. But I think that's why she she went to such younger men. They were easier to entertain. And in the end, she got sex. And if any hope, maybe a new husband who had money, but when you're looking at teenage boys, you're not going to get much. She fit the profile of a pedophile through and through without question. It may not have been something as serious in 1965 as it would be today, because I guarantee you a 37-year-old woman dances like that for a 14-year-old boy, she's going to be led away in handcuffs before it's all said and done with, right? Well, not in 1965. Blind eyes were turned. And, I'll sh and we'll go into more depth into that once we get into the trial. But it just, it just baffles me that she could be so indiscreet with them. And, and other, other people knew this. Other people knew of the stories of her and these teenage boys. And nothing was said. Nothing was ever done. I don't know. Now, one night after Gertrude's arrest... The talk of sex and boys came up and Sylvia, she goes into a little bit more detail about California and her boyfriend and what had kind of happened there. And we talked about it. She went under the covers, kissing, touching, but nothing that would bring into question her virtue, right? Well, Gertrude, she starts getting the details and she's like, hey, Sylvia, have you ever been with a boy? And Sylvia's like, well, yeah, I mean, yeah, kind of. And they get to talking about the boys that she would hang out with around the parks in California. And then came the story of the party they threw in California when the, her parents were in Vegas. And this is when she went underneath the covers and committed, oh my gosh, the ultimate sin. But the most troubling thing about this whole situation is not Sylvia and what she did or didn't do with this boy. It's Gertrude and the way she reacted to the story because she starts questioning Sylvia and her purity, but her sweet, darling 17-year-old daughter who's in the home, she's pregnant three months along with some married man's baby and the married man didn't even leave his wife for her. So it's just... It's a two-way street for her. I say it's a two-way street. It's a one-way street for her. If you're Sylvia, in the wrong. But Paula, no, that's my sweet, innocent daughter. And I, I wouldn't believe that she's pregnant or could have done something so sinful with a married man. Ugh. Now, as this starts talking, within a few days after this discussion, Gertrude starts making comments about Sylvia saying things like, mm, your stomach's getting big, like with a baby big. And Sylvia thinks she's joking. So she jokingly replies back, oh, yeah, it sure is. I'm getting big. I'm just going to have to go on a diet, right? Okay, remember, they're only eating bread with butter and soup. She can't be getting any bigger than a toothpick, right? She's probably losing weight. And that's why I think she responded the way she did, because how could you be that serious? It's not like we have an abundance amount of food in the home. Well, her 
jokingly replying in that manner, piss go Gertrude off, she stands up, rears back, and kicks her in between the legs. And when we go into the autopsy, extensive damage to that part of Sylvia is noted, and this could be why. Gertrude, she has a different... What is everybody's fascination whenever we're covering crimes where children have been abused we seem to see the same pattern used time over time there is extensive abuse to the genitals what is that fascination i can't get past this and i'm sure if we could go back and do freudism or something it would pop up right but I don't, it irritates me to no end for me to be going through a case and see there was extensive abuse done to a genital of a child because I'm thinking, seriously, people, how would you feel if the same things were happening to you? But on the flip side, I'm starting to see that it is used more for humiliation um, there is pain that comes with it, no matter if you're a boy or girl. It may not be the same pain, but they both experience pain when kicked between the legs. It's not, it's not a freaking rainbow, right? So there is pain that comes with it, but I think it's more of a humiliation kind of, of torture that they are leaning towards because for kids, when you're going through puberty, it's awkward. You you just don't want nobody to look at you. You don't want to talk about your your private areas. You just it's just weird as a child as you're going through all of this. And I think maybe they feed off of that. They feed off of that humility that comes from the abuse to that part of their bodies. That's the only thing I can come up with. Now, in September of 1965, the kids, they headed off back to school, and Sylvia had re-enrolled at Arsenal Technical School, and she was going back to school. Remember, she had dropped out in January on her 16th birthday. She decided she was done. She was going to follow the footsteps of her father and her mother and her brother, but that was short-lived. She decided while living at the Baines Whiskey, she would go to school. She didn't like school, wasn't her favorite, but I think that she saw it as a way to get out of the home and possibly reduce the amount of times that she would irritate Gertrude. Now, Arsenal Technical School was once one of Indiana's largest preparatorial schools, and today it's not, but it still stands and children still attend Arsenal Technical. It has been confused with being a woman's penitentiary in 1965 due to its cinder block walls and its large wrought iron fencing. It doesn't look the same today. If you go and look it up now, it's beautiful. You wouldn't think it's a women's pen penitentiary, but in 1965, going past it, you were like, mm, that's sketchy. It was located two blocks north and two miles west of the home at 3850 East New York Street. Now, Stephanie, she's 15. She was in school with Sylvia, and Stephanie loves school. She loves to learn. She, ex she especially loves history and anything to do with law. She even has this, had this desire to become a lawyer, even telling the judge once, quote, if school were a man, I'd marry it, end quote. She wanted to learn everything that she could. Now, it said that when Sylvia and Stephanie entered school, they became closer. I don't know how much closer two can be when they became friends when Stephanie came home from her dad's and realized we've got two new people living in the home. But then they became closer at school, and I think it's because they both decided to work inside the cafeteria. And by doing so, this ensured that both of them would receive at least one hot meal every day because you never knew whether or not you were going to get something off the hot plate that night for dinner or just a sandwich. It you never knew, okay? So they were close. Stephanie thought she was a friend. Sylvia thought Stephanie was a friend. Even though Sylvia did not express the same desires about her education that Stephanie did, they still were really close. Now, Jenny, she 
also went into school and so did Paula. Paula had apparently dropped out prior and decided she was going to go back. However, due to the fact that she was working at her new job in a drugstore during the day, she was only allowed to go to Arsenal Technical High School during the evening, taking evening courses in order to complete her education. The home at 3850 East New York Street was just barely inside the bounds of the Arsenal Technical High School, which means Richard Hobbs, who had frequented in and out of the home, he lived just a couple houses away from the Baines Whiskies, but he had to attend a different school at Thomas Carr Howe High School, and that's where Coy Hubbard, Stephanie's boyfriend, was attending as well. So Richard and Coy became friends. I mean, they were in and out of the Baines Whiskey's house as much as any of them. Stephanie, she when they visited the grandparents, Coy and Stephanie met. This just is a circle that just round about and it didn't close until Sylvia and Jenny walked into the Baines Whiskey's home that fateful day on July 3rd of 1965. Now, Johnny Baines Whiskey had moved back to Gertrude's after being with his father during the summer, and he was 12. And him and Jenny, they attended public school number 78, or PS number 78, or PS, is it PS 78? I don't know, I'm not sure. But that's where they attended school. And when Lester came to visit his girls and on September 30th, and he learned that they were both in school, they were both going to school, he could not have been prouder of them. However, had he taken three seconds to contact either one of the schools, he would learn that he, neither one of his girls had a very good attendance record. Jenny and Sylvia miss school frequently, and Gertrude was called as a result. And Gertrude would make up all kinds of stuff, okay? But when pushed to the max, it was simply, they don't want to go and I can't make them. She even went down to PS78 and Arsenal and talked to faculty regarding the attendance of the Likens girls, and she played it off and they believed her. Now, here's the thing with this matriarch. In front of an adult, there needs to be an act put on. Otherwise, they are going to see through her and see that she's nothing more than a lazy piece of shit. No. <laughs> she's a lazy woman who is just looking for coattails to ride on, right? She's waiting for the right young man to come through her door and sweep her off her feet and take her away from all the troubles that she has as a single parent. So they would be able to see those stressors. But Gertrude was a better actor or actress than, than giving credit because the schools never blinked an eye to what she had to say in regards to Sylvia and Jenny. Never once did they question her. And at home, Gertrude didn't have to put on any kind of facade or act or whatever because she's 37 and these are teenagers and they look up to her and she knows it. She has them all under her thumb and none of them realize that what they are doing will play a major role in their life going forth. On October 6th of 1965, Sylvia drops out of, Arsen of Arsenal Technical High School. This leaves her friend Stephanie dumbstruck. She can't fathom why Sylvia would drop out. She knew she didn't like school, but Sylvia, that was her getaway. And she couldn't figure out what had changed her mind. In reality, Gertrude had forbid Sylvia from going to school again. She was not allowed. And this came shortly after Sylvia had come home um, from school and she needed money for a gym uniform. And she had even asked Gertrude for the money and she said no. Gertrude was not giving it to her. And so one afternoon, Sylvia comes home after talking with Gertrude about this uniform and she has a gym uniform. And immediately Gertrude snaps and she's like, you stole it. 
And Sylvia's like, I didn't steal it. I found it. It was on a sidewalk. It just, I needed one and I didn't turn it into lost and found. Gertrude's like, no, you stole it. You took it. You took it. And she is yelling at Sylvia, slapping her in the face, hitting her, trying to get her to confess to the theft. But in reality, she didn't do nothing. And Stephanie, she had been bitten by a spider in the home a few days prior. So she wasn't even at school the day that Sylvia found the uniform. Therefore, she couldn't corroborate the story. So Sylvia, eventually, she caves. And she tells her, you know, she took it. And this is in hopes to make Gertrude stop hitting her. However, that's not what happened. Gertrude grabbed her hair and yanked her around as Sylvia's confessing. And so once she's confessed, then Gertrude goes and gets this three inch wide black belt that John Bainswitzky had given her as an old police belt. And he said to use it to keep the kids in line. So she goes up and she gets that belt and she beat Sylvia. And then Jenny's beat with the belt too because Gertrude remembers, oh yeah, she stole that shoe from the park. So let me just spank you in the process. The, you know, the, the park incident had happened far before school started. And now Gertrude's just, I'll, I'll just beat you for whatever I feel like, whatever I remember. After the whipping, Sylvia is forced to sit down on the couch, and this is where Gertrude decides she needs to lecture her on the evils of premarital sex. However, let's remember, Gertrude went by Gertrude Wright. However, she was still legally Gertrude Baines Whiskey because Dennis Wright and Gertrude had never gotten married, meaning Dennis Wright Jr., born out of wedlock, premarital sex. Everything that she is pre preaching against, Gertrude is doing. So she says one thing, she does another. Mm. So after she's lecturing her about the evils of premarital sex and reprimanding her for being in the boy and being in the bed under the covers with the boy from California, then she decides, I'm going to humiliate you just a little bit further. So Sylvia, she gets up to her feet and Gertrude kicks her once again in the vagina. This is the type of injury that comes into play with an autopsy later. It just continues and continues. And the abuse didn't stop there for the night. After being lectured about the, the evils of premarital sex, she then needs to pay the piper for stealing. So Gertrude decides to use a lighter and burn Sylvia's fingertips. All of them. All ten. And this will teach her not to steal. Finally, Sylvia is whipped a two more times before the whole incident with the gym uniform is over. The sick and sadistic torture of Sylvia has not even reached the breaking point thus far. Three months into boarding. Each day, Sylvia woke up hoping that she would not do something to anger the very stressed matriarch. But she could sit in one spot all day, not speaking or moving, and Gertrude would find something to punish her for. Sometimes, Sylvia was even punished for Jenny's transgressions. We could speculate all day, questioning every little detail, trying to dive into the psyche of Gertrude Baines Whiskey Wright. But the truth is, we may never fully understand what was going through her mind each time she decided that Sylvia had committed an offense. But there was no denying that for some unsung reason, Gertrude despised Sylvia. Maybe it's because Sylvia was beautiful, young, 16 with her whole life ahead of her the boys noticed her and gertrude she was 37 and her young lover left her alone to raise their son and all of her children 
their young teenage boys were no longer looking at Gertrude, who was willing to do anything for their attention. The young teenage boys were no longer looking at Gertrude, who was willing to do anything for the attention the teenage girls were getting. And against her daughters, she knew she could win. She was willing to sleep with them, and as far as she knew, Paula and Stephanie hadn't crossed over that line just yet. A blind eye was turned to the rumors and the telltale signs of Paula and her pregnancy. I want to thank you all for joining me tonight as we tackle this case that became one of the biggest media sensations in Indiana's history. This isn't an easy one to listen to or dive into. The only thing clear in this whole case is Gertrude's hatred for the young teenage girl. It was present from the moment Gertrude laid eyes on the two Likens girl. Join me next week for more in the Sylvia Likens case. And as always, I leave you with one last line. People have a habit of inventing fictions they will believe wholeheartedly in order to ignore the truth they cannot accept. Much love, the true crime librarian. <laughs>